Is the government lying to you on inflation? The jobs data came in totally wrong. And now Biden wants to buy votes by giving Americans money to buy houses instead of fixing the fundamental problem. Anton Stentner podcast number 54. And we're wondering, is the government lying to us? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> okay. Specifically about inflation, because you mentioned the other day, I can't wait to talk about the CPI and obviously that having to do a lot with inflation. And you said, um, I think they're kind of messing with us. Or you mentioned the Fed. I don't know if it's going to be in this section or not. This is exactly Yeah. It. So tell me, because I'm very curious, because you also told me you think they're playing games. So can you explain what's happening and what you mean by that? So they're playing games. So let's kind of walk through some mental thoughts here. Does the government have an agenda? Yes. Do they have their own political motivations to do things? Yes. Have they lied to us in the past? Yes. So are they trying to control the stock market, the real estate market's reaction to inflation data? Maybe. I would say yes. And so what I'd like to do is let's, like, let's discuss this more. So this data may or may not be a lie, okay? But we want to jump into it, and then we're going to talk about the implications of the data, and then how this has changed over time, what's changed, and then where they're fudging this at. Headline CPA or CPI projection was 0.4 month on month and 3.1 year on year. As everyone knows, the headline actually came in at 0.4 with a 3.2 year on year. So it was higher than expected. It beat expectations. This is a problem. Okay. Core CPI was projected to be 0.3 or 3.7 year on year. Actually, it came in at 0.36 month on month and 3.8 year on year. So both headline and core beat to the upside, they beat expectations. Ugh, this is a problem. So, is core CPI more important to the Fed than headline? The Fed is always more concerned about core because it takes out the volatile food and energy. And when you look at core over a longer period of time, it's more indicative of what's happening in the market. But the fact that both of them, regardless of how you slice it, beat to the upside, that's the start of a trend that's not moving in the right direction. Just to clarify one more thing. Yeah. We had high inflation, right? A year and a half ish ago, like really high, scary high. They had to put the brakes on. Um, Inflation did eventually go down. And we thought that inflation would be going even more down in the last few months, this month, so that interest rates would potentially go down as well. But the implication is... The implication is the Fed can't cut now. The implication is everything's still more expensive. The implication is if you look at you know the change in month over month, it technically got more expensive. That's the implication. And so then we got to dig into this, right? So shelter and energy were really to blame for this red hot inflation number. They made up about 70% of the problem. So... The shelter index rose 5.7% on an unadjusted annual basis, or 0.4 month over month. Energy prices rose um, a bunch. See, they had been declining, and then all of a sudden, the index jumped 2.3% in February after following 0.9% in January. So in other words, gas and everything else was getting cheaper, then boom, it bounced up. Part of it was gas. So gas climbed significant 3.8% from January to February after falling 3.3 the previous month. Okay, so the Fed, they already started telegraphing us this to us. They said, higher for longer. They said, inflation is sticky. It takes longer to work through our, this economic system than people want. So what's happening is people like me, investors, homeowners, business owners, consumers, we all thought it was going to happen faster. And then the market started pricing in those rate cuts early. So they're pricing in the rate cut early for March. And when you get this beat to the upside, then they start looking at it on like a three-month or a six-month basis. So um, this is what uh, Nick T said from the uh, Wall Street Journal. 
He said the three month and the six month are trending up while the 12 month is still still trending down. But see, if you're looking at it and you shorten the time horizon and that three month is trending up and the six month is trending up, it's telling you it may not trend down now over the long term because the shorter term version of inflation is going up. And usually the long term follows that. Potentially. Potentially. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so this is cause for or for you to go, okay, what's happening? What's happening is you can say later on this month in March, the odds of a rate cut are basically zero. Okay? This is not financial advice. Don't go bet the farm on this. But it's the Fed's not going to cut in March. The stock market was originally pricing in as a forward-looking indicator. That's what the stock market is. It looks forward in time and it makes bets based on future outcomes. And it said its future outcome was the first cut was coming in March. Okay, then we got a little bit of hot inflation data, got a little bit of high employment data, and then bam, it comes in hot again on both employment and inflation. So we know no rate cuts in March. And with this recent... Uh, inflation data, what it's saying is the Fed is now actually probably unlikely to cut in May. So this ball is getting pushed down the field with the market predicting a 70% chance of a cut in June. But let's work through this, okay? So the Fed meets and then the Fed has the FOMC meetings, the the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, and those are specifically in March, June, September, and December. When they have the FOMC meetings, they have um, press conferences around it. So they don't need to do a physical cut in June because they can use their voice around the FOMC meeting to control the market. So I think now... And once again, this is based on the totality of the data as we review it, just like Jerome Powell does. I think this got pushed back to maybe July, maybe September. Now, the same argument comes up again in September because of the Fed Open Market Committee meeting, which means, well, let's just say we get one in July or June. You probably won't see one in September because then you have the presidential election right after that starting in November. So from a political and kind of that outward optics, the Fed has said multiple times, we do not want to be seen as biased. So they can't really do a bunch of cutting right before the election. So my prediction right now is, Let's say we get one in June, maybe July, okay, and then maybe again December. I think max you're getting three, and you might only end up with two now. So the Fed and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and our Census Bureau are monkeying with this data to make it seem a little different than it is. Now, one other thing that we haven't been talking about is... Let's remember we, that the Federal Reserve also has quantitative tightening hiding in their back pocket. So quantitative easing is when the Fed goes and buys a bunch of mortgage-backed securities and bonds and sucks them on their balance sheet to artificially lower interest rates. Well, the Fed has been taking that large balance sheet and they've been selling off that balance sheet, which is called quantitative tightening. Shrinking it down and it's impacting the economy less and less, right? As they shrink their balance sheet specifically, it keeps long-term interest rates higher because they're shoving more bonds into the market, keeping interest rates higher. So something that they can do that they're hiding in their back pocket that they can do without announcing to the general public, which wouldn't necessarily cause the stock market to moon or real estate to moon, would be they could slow down the selling off of their balance sheet which in effect would be loosening financial conditions. Wouldn't people pick up on that? People will pick up on that. It's a better sleight of hand. The crowd knows what the magician is doing, but they don't care as much. Because they don't understand it. Because they don't understand it. They just it. know quantitative. They're like, that doesn't sound like we, something we should be doing. Or maybe it's something you do when there's emergency. You know, like versus raising interest rates up yes. and down, everyone can relate to that. And everyone can understand 
CPI because they say CPI is our measure of inflation. The government doesn't talk about quantitative tightening and quantitative easing over and over again like we talk about CPI. It's not in the general public's, you know, vocabulary to bring these things up. Well, okay, uh, just uh, yeah. entertain me. Which one is more important? The raising of the interest rate and lowering of the interest rate from the Fed or quantitative easing and tightening? That's a great question. I don't know that one is more important than the other. They're like, um, it's like adding more weight to one side of the teeter-totter. It simply makes the effect stronger. And when you combine the two of them, it makes a very strong effect. Now, one thing I also, because the jobs number came in so good, I think the Fed's going to wait as long as humanly possible because they do want more tricks in their bag if they have to lower interest rates. See, when the Fed cut rates to zero, they couldn't do anything to stimulate the economy if the economy needed it. Now let's go into the government agenda. Why? The government is creating higher inflation and higher than reported so that we can get rid of our national debt. See, the strength of the dollar allows us to force feed our debt to other nations and other countries. This game only works while the dollar is supreme. You can go to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve, specifically to the FRED website, and you can see that the U.S. national debt has grown to $34 trillion. So one thing that you can do is if you keep inflation higher for longer, that $34 trillion is not as expensive because you're eroding the purchasing power of the dollar by keeping inflation higher for longer, and thus making that $34 trillion less impactful. Okay, switch total gears now. Now I want to go to the opposite side of the equation and talk about, the. and you guys can go check this website out, please do. So know that we're always going to try to give you both sides of an argument. So you can go check for yourselves because this is what our listeners do. They're informed. They're smart people. So you can go to shadowstats.com. And this is what I mean when I say the government, they lie. They monkey with the data. They figure out the data that best serves them. So if you go look at inflation data, how it was reported in the 1980s and the 1990s, you can see as inflation's come down here in the U.S., if we look at the 1980s alternative, you would see that inflation is still sitting around 12%. If you look at the 1990s alternative, you would see that inflation is sitting at just below 7%. So what they've done over time is our government has changed how inflation was calculated and reported to make these adjustments so inflation looks lower. Why? So that they don't get blamed for the problem or that they are doing a better job than they really are? So they're doing a better job than they really are. So these politicians get reelected so that we can offload our debt to other people at a discounted rate. Other people being Americans? I should say other countries. Everyone that uses the dollar, right? Everyone that uses the dollar. But we export that debt via the dollar and our bonds to other countries. And then lastly, so they wouldn't have to pay higher wages for people who are in retirement that are government workers and on Social Security because the COLA, the cost of living adjustments, are tied into the CPIs. So they said 1980, well, we don't, that looks too high. Let's recalculate that. 1990, oh, well, let's recalculate that. And then a couple weeks ago, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out and said, you know what? Uh, we're going to change a variable in the way uh, we report this data, um, and we're not going to really explain it to you, but I uh, just know we did it. And so they changed something, but they hasn't fully disclosed it. Okay, number three, let's now flip this coin over again. So now we're like a three-sided coin. We're on the other side of the pyramid. Let's go look at the opposite argument that inflation has actually plummeted and that the true rate of inflation is less than what the government is reporting to us right now. And the reason they're reporting a higher number so they can keep rates higher for longer, okay? So you can find this on trueflation.com. 
Trueflation.com is a groundbreaking protocol making powerful financial data transparent, accessible, and censorship resistant. So this is one of those tokenized things. It, this is beautiful. So as of 3-13-2024, they said the daily trueflation rate, so the daily rate of inflation is 1.65. When our government just reported it as 3.1 month over month and 3.2. Their method of measuring it, so remember, the government uses lagging data and they box it all together. This is real-time data looking at it. They're saying it's 1.65. So this is why I said, well, maybe the government is lying to you to keep it higher for longer to serve their agenda. What I also really liked is because the, the average American, their purchasing power has been hit significantly. And everyone knows things right now are just more expensive for them. So they have another thing on Trueflation where they calculate the U.S. inflation rate aggregated since January 2020. And what they do is they use this to calculate your change in your purchasing power. So they believe the average American, based on their data sources, their purchasing power has been eroded by 23.62%. So let's just round up because it's 24. So 24% of your purchasing power is gone due to this inflation over the last, you know, little over three years. I know that some of you are feeling that. And so like, if... If that number's low, let us know. If that number is like too high, let us know. Like, what are you feeling? Do you think it's around 24% of your purchasing power? Is it more? Is it less? And then also, if you answer that, tell me where you live, because I want to know how this is affecting different parts of the country. So um, I can speak to that. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the 1.5% inflation versus what they're reporting the three percent or so it makes sense even though prices are really high i don't feel like they're going higher and the reason i know this is steak prices <laughs> i knew how much i paid for this certain type of steak at this certain grocery store all the time i looked at that number and it just stayed basically a certain place forever and during the pandemic it started to go up and they started printing money, started to go up. And up and up to the point where it was literally a 50% increase in prices. This is a premium product, okay? Premium steak. Yeah. What, what kind American of steak? American Wagyu. Oh, there we go. And I was like, this is so crazy that even for me, I like to treat friends and family when they come over the house. So I buy the nice steak or whatever. But is that a price where I was like, you know, I'm going to go to Costco. And the price actually has come down just slightly. Yeah. Now, it's nowhere near where it once was, but it's definitely not as high. My point is this. It's not just a steak. It's everything across the board. The price has stayed still or actually come down. It has come down on a lot of yeah. products. So what's interesting about what you're saying is I'm actually experiencing it. I still complain to the cashier. <laughs> like, dang, man, I can't. Play. Like, I feel bad. Because I don't want to be complaining, but I'm like, can't believe it. And they're like, yeah, you and everybody else, right? And they're yeah. nodding their head, whatever. And I guess the point is I can maybe see some truth in then fudging if there is this agenda. My one last question on this topic before I move on to the jobs data is let's take us all that we just discussed and take it home to explain to the buyer, seller, and investor. Why is CPI and inflation in general important to them? Why is it that you, as a real estate investor and agent, pay attention to it, and why should other people pay attention to it? Inflation and interest rates are tied together. So as inflation goes up, interest rates go up. As inflation goes down, interest rates go down. So what we're doing is we're looking at inflation as a forward-looking indicator for when we should be making good long-term bets. What this is telling us is just like Jerome Powell said, he didn't lie to you. He said higher for longer. Rates are going to be higher than we want them to be in 2024. It also means late 24 or 25 that that's going to start to create opportunity as rates come down. 
And as rates come down, what happens is more buyers qualify and investors get better deals. So activity will continue to go up. So we're looking because what will happen is inflation will move, then interest rates and bonds, and you'll see it all moving. But if the three and the six uh, month inflation rates start to get under control, know the Fed's going to lower rates. It, it's, it's, it's inevitable because right now they're too tight. Okay, This current data says don't lower the rates, though. And so it gives you opportunity to be planting seeds for the future on good deals. We'll just be watching. We'll be reporting on this. This is why you subscribe, why you hang out with us, and why you listen. I want to give the opposite side of this or just a different part too. So lastly, the government, we have to remember, they're currently running a deficit on their spending. So as the government's running a deficit, even though rates are high, that acts like stimulus. And then when they pass those acts, like the Inflation Reduction Act, that also acts as stimulus. It feeds money into the economy that wouldn't normally be there. So they are still artificially propping up the economy by overspending. We would need the deficits to go away and these acts that provide tax incentives and money to go away to know where the true economy is sitting. So even though the economy looks good on paper, the economy doesn't feel good to the average person because it's propped up. Because my American Wagyu is still expensive. Bingo. Until this stops, it's going to be massively inflationary, which will keep us in the higher for longer scenario. Let's move on to jobs data and why you say it's wrong. With all data, with all statistics, with all information, you, what humans like to do is we like to see the, the big number, see the one idea, make a, make a snap decision in our mind because we're busy, and then go, oh, that's what this means. This is what's happening. But the devil is always in the details, and there's always more information hiding beneath the surface. It's like the iceberg. The tip is just sitting there, and then 80% of it's sitting below the surface. So the payrolls data comes out and it says 275,000 jobs, and the expectation was 200. When the reality is, was all the information was sitting below the surface and no one took the time to dig into it. So, okay, we're going to go through what they said. We're going to go through some of the numbers. And then we're going to go through why this is a bunch of BS. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the U.S. economy added 275,000 jobs in February. Unemployment rose to 3.9%, the highest rate since January of 2022. There was a spike in construction, retail, and food service jobs that contributed to the surprising gain. It was a, it was a barn burner, a, just a huge gain. Okay, now we dig into the details. January's number was revised down 124,000. December's number was revised down 43,000. Average hourly earnings month on month only went up 0.1. So in other words, we paid people less. And we had to go back to the previous reports because once again, I told you they're starting to monkey with these things and say, oh, just kidding, that data was wrong. 124,000 wrong? Like if, if, if it's the CFO that works for my company and they came in and said, hey, I missed projections by 60%, you're fired. Does anyone get fired in the government? No, they say, congratulations, let's give you a bonus, let's give you a raise. Oh, by the way, your retirement plan is only tied into the CPI, which we've adjusted three times. So we know this number is a bunch of BS is garbage. The headline number is 275 with huge reduction. But the Fed wants to see signs that the labor market is slowing and will continue to moderate. Because as that labor market slows down, and unemployment rises, what happens is there's less demand, so wage growth slows down, and then there's less spending. When you dig into the jobs number even deeper, what, here's what you see and why the numbers were so skewed and why they should have never reported this as a win. And the stock market should have never responded to this in the bond market. If you look, it was heavily skewed towards part-time employment. So what's happening because... You know, according to Trueflation, people's purchasing power has been eroded by 23.62% since January of 2020. That means the average person has gone and got a second job, gotten a third job. So this is people getting more part-time jobs 
the federal government comes out, pats himself on the back and say, look, the economy is doing good. Do you feel like the economy is doing good? This is directed at the audience. Do you feel like, oh my goodness, I can work less right now? Have your expenses gone up? Does it feel like it's pinching you more? So with less wage growth, over, uh, um, they, can, they view that as a measure of inflation. But the problem is that the jobs data came out before the inflation data. Then as the inflation data came out, Jerome Powell probably looked at his, at his compadres and said, oh, crap. Hey, it looked like we were beating this. By the way, March is off the table. May is probably off the table. We might be able to reduce in June. They increased at 4.3% and they were forecasted to be 44 So what's happening is we had a massive explosion in expenses. Actually, I want to take this a step back. COVID happened. Between the money printing and the stimulus done in the form of government bills, $13.5 trillion enters the, the economy. What happens then is we have housing rise massively. We have expenses rise massively. But we don't have wages rise massively to keep up with that. So even though there's a lot of good economic data being put out right now, the average person does not feel like that's good economic data. And I'll tell you, everyone I talk to doesn't feel like it's good right now. It's only the government who's saying we got good economic data. Okay, now... We're going to dip our toe into politics here for two seconds, so bear with me. It's interesting. I don't care which way you're going to vote, but this is just specific. It's interesting how this strong jobs report is actually bad news for the current sitting president, President Biden. Because with economic indicators pointing good, the Fed can't reduce interest rates. But the average consumer doesn't feel the way the economic indicators are pointing. So it hurts the sitting president. It hurts whoever's there, and it actually helps the incumbent party coming in. This goes back to why I believe the Fed is not going to risk reducing their, like, right before the election to seeing to be seen as part of uh, being part of the political process and exhibiting political bias. So even though wages are up and unemployment is below historic uh, averages and inflation is cooling in most sectors and the average family's net worth went up, the average American doesn't feel like they can buy more. It's crazy. And it's just because of all the money that came into the system. I mean, you could just say that just from real estate alone, from house prices alone, what's the difference between January 2020 and uh, January 2024? Just like ballpark number. Let's go to the... Yeah. We're going to go to the Fed's there website and we're going to look it up. The Fed's website for real estate? Yep. Yeah. Because the they show the median price. Okay. St. Louis yep. Federal Reserve. Uh, go to the Fed. Median sales home price. So right now, the median sale home price in the U.S. as of Q4 of 2024 is 417000 And right before the pandemic, uh, it's a little harder to do this on your phone. Q1 of 2020, 329000 Of 2020? Q1 of 2020, 329000 2020. So, correct. 300000 329. 329. So. Okay. So we're going to go, we're going to do the math for everyone. Here's how you do this. You take the absolute value, take 400, 417,000. Okay. Uh, 700 plus 329 uh, gives you 450,600. You divide by two to get an average. That's 225,300. Then you take the 417, 700 minus the 329, gives you 88,700. Divided by, oh, there's the number, uh, 225, 300 times 100. The, av the median home price in the United States from Q1 of 2020, right before the pandemic, to today, Q1 of 2024, has shot up 39.37%. Wow. So people's purchasing power got eroded by approximately 24 and their asset values went up even more. So this is when we, we talked about this before. 
This is that K-shaped recovery. It's the people with assets grew during the whole process, and the people who didn't got hit and slid down even further. So if you owned a home, you basically beat the inflation in the area, and you made, so 39.36 minus 23.62. A homeowner going off of Trueflation's number made 15.75% more by owning the asset during that same time period. Now, but that doesn't actually matter, and hear me out. If you own your home, that's not really a investment. It's just something you need. Because what do you have to do when you move out of your home? You have to move into another home. It's kind of a wash, right? Yeah. Locally. Now, if you go to a market where it's lower, it might benefit you, okay? But we're just talking about the average family. Most people don't move around like that or move to a lower market. But, I mean, just take the real estate in general. 40%. A house in general, on average, costs 40% more. Could be a little bit lower in your market, a little bit higher, Okay. But are you making 40% no. more in your salary? <laughs> no. This whole discussion of uh, whether, you know, like, tr uh, what, did, what did he say? What did Papa Powell say? This is transitory or... Inflation is, is transitory. It's not a big deal or like all these games you're saying. Just take that data alone. 40% more. What are you making more? And I think a lot of people might be making the same. So based on... Bloomberg Financials LP data. So pre-pandemic, it looks like we were, and we could dig into these numbers. So I'm, this is a guesstimate real quick, looking at the chart. The, the two targets the Fed's trying to hit, the Fed's trying to hit a target of 2% inflation, 3% wage growth. That's their like happy land. Okay. So if it was their happy land, 3% over a four-year run is only 12%, which is not 40, number one. Wage growth did get higher during that time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to average 2020, and we're going to say 2020 was 5%. We're going to say 2020 was also 5. 2022 was probably 4.5, and, and then this year looks like it, uh, you know, we're starting out at like 4. Okay, let's just round up generously. Yes. That's still 20%. It's less than 20. You're, so you're, you're talking correct. the biggest asset in your life. And, and you yep. know, imagine this. Like, this is just kind of crazy. Not only does this affect people, especially that don't own a house or didn't own a house and they're moving into a house, right? But think about the people that own a house at those low interest rates Yes. I want to just get into an equally how the same house like somewhere else or you know want to move up. It's ex more expensive for everybody. Yes. So this problem of inflation, like this is just kind of how uh, this is my summary is a bigger deal than people know. But inflation is one of the easiest ways for a government to tax you. 100%. But you don't see it. It's not a bill that comes from the IRS. It's a bill that comes from your neighborhood repairman that just has to raise his prices because equipment costs more. Or the grocery bill, like I keep complaining about, is more expensive just because, guess what? They have to raise their prices for higher wages. That's what's so crazy. I mean, I know you talked about this, but in the same way to say what you just said from a different angle, Inflation is government's hidden tax to pay for the additional government spending and debt. And they're literally passing it off to you whether you want it or not. Okay, now, since we're on the topic of government and we're going to dip into politics, tell me about Biden and how he's mo using money to buy votes. So, so... You know, every president does this. It's not just Biden. He released his budget proposal. And as he released his budget proposal, what he proved to me definitively is he doesn't understand housing. And that he wants to give people free money to buy a home. And throwing money at the housing problem doesn't fundamentally solve the problem. The fundamental problem in housing is the lack of supply. Throwing money at that issue doesn't solve it. So we'll come back and clarify that. This proposal would spend $258 billion to create 2 million affordable housing units, 
support million of first. I copy this right off the web, uh, the White House website's press release. Support millions of first time home buyers, guarantee affordable housing for hundreds of thousands of extremely low income veterans and youth aging out of the foster care, and advance efforts to end homelessness. Okay. Well, first off, listeners. Has the government ever created affordable housing in your area that has been impactful? Just put it, yes, they've done it, or no, they've done it, have not. I looked at the last affordable housing com, uh, uh, proposal here in Washington State. They were going to deliver apartment units at approximately $467,000 a unit when the Seattle Metro... As an entrepreneur, if, if Benji and I went and built this apartment building and went and got a bunch of investors, we would we would come out with those units at anywhere between three to three hundred and fifty thousand. So the government, right off the get, is going to waste an additional hundred and twenty grand minimum. Okay, that's a project I looked at right here in the Seattle Metro, government funded. So one, they can't do affordable housing. They've proven it time and time again. Every time I've looked at it, two. They're attacking this as a, a demand side, not a supply side. And I want to break down how this would directly impact a first-time home buyer and a move-up home buyer if this comes into existence. So this is a proposal. This isn't law that they put out there, but they're, they're going to push really hard. So the first-time home, uh, home buyer tax credit is a $10,000 tax credit that happens over two years. It's a direct off of your taxes. So like you get $10,000 over two years and you get it in 2024 and 2025, which would be $5,000 a year. So this is just off of your taxes, not like a check that goes to you. Correct. Off of your taxes. Because, you know, the government's not operating in a deficit and currently $34 trillion in the hole. So let's add more to it. So take five grand, divide it by 12, you get $416.67 uh, dollars a month. And the median priced home here in the U.S. is 417700 That's according to the St. Louis Federal Reserve. So I ran the calculation, 5% down. Today's interest rate, 6.85. This is buying no points. 0.15% for homeowners insurance, 1% for property and taxes, plus it had mortgage insurance. Your total payment is $3,344.37. Here's how that breaks down. Your principal and interest is about $2,600. Your property taxes is about $348. Homeowner's insurance is $52. Mortgage insurance is uh, $344, getting you that monthly payment of $344.37. Now, if we simply add in the $416 a month we're giving them, what we're doing is we're allowing the buyer to qualify for more because we're giving them extra income. That extra income would instantly allow the buyer to qualify for a $468,000 house or over $50,000 more in that additional savings. So if we give every first time home buyer 50% more qualifying power here in the US, would we sell more homes, yes or yes? Yes. Would there be more demand? Yes. Would it create more bidding wars? Yes. So it would drive up prices? 100%. So this is like when you see these things, you literally go, come on, people. You can't do math. This is all demand and we need supply. So it's not cool to fix these problems. It's not sexy to fix the problem. What is the problem? The lack of supply was created during the Great Recession across the United States because we built so many less houses, 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And what's happened is the available buildable land has gone down. The permitting, zoning requirements, red tape has gone up. The cost of land has gone up. The construction costs have gone up. So the timelines and everything. If you want to fix this, you have to go to the supply side and incentivize the supply side. Okay, now let's look at it if you're a move-up seller because they said they want to do this for middle-class Americans. So the middle-class American could sell their home, get a $10,000 tax credit too, if this comes into existence. 
For the middle class American, what they do is they define that as a person who owns a home around the median price in their county or below. Well, the median price in Snohomish County is almost 800 grand. So almost, I mean, 60% of home sellers would qualify for this uh, credit in our area right now. It'll give them 10,000 over one year. Okay. So that 10,000 over one year for the move up or the middle class home buyer would give them a hundred thousand dollars in additional purchasing power. If you sprinkle a hundred thousand dollars in demand all across the United States for all these buyers that would be move up buyers, it's going to massively drive up prices and massively kill the unaffordability even more. That's when I read this, I was like, you don't get it. You're buying votes, you're driving up prices. I am for home attainability, home ownership attainability, not affordability. When they say affordability, they can cram them into rentals and say it's affordable. I want home ownership. Home ownership is only fixed on the supply side. Sorry. No, <laughs> no, I, no I am actually fascinated that you broke all these numbers down because I think everybody understands you print more money, there's more money to spend, and they're going to spend the money. And yes. with the houses, the, the numbers are astronomical. And then that would lead to inflation. But when you break it down like this and you actually put like, oh, this lady makes it so they have 50% more buying power or 100% more buying power. 50K or 100K. Yeah. Um, the one thing we haven't talked about right now, you kind of landed on it, but in the uh, in like uh, the opposite way, what's the number one problem with real estate right now outside of home prices? What's the number one problem? Lack of supply low inventory yeah. so if you everyone else can afford more yes. because they're getting free money or tax incentives yes but there's not enough houses it just gets more competitive yep. like i was just talking about my american wagyu steak okay but a house it's even more significant yes and of course even more important because that's everybody needs a home we're talking both the first time home buyer or the move up buyer right so it's uh it's inevitable that house prices are going to go up. I don't know if this is the direction you were going, which is of course the the big question is when should I buy a house? When, when you know <laughs> <laughs> or the other question when's home prices going to go down because everyone's thinking oh we're going to have to have some kind of correction, kind of the same way people yeah. thought we're going to have kind of a recession, right? Yeah. And it's looking based off of the data There's that it's not going to go down even more so now because I'm actually going to summarize a whole podcast right now. Yeah. You talked about in the beginning how the data is showing inflation is even more sticky. Yep. They're not going to lower interest rates. They might even hold or maybe they have to, if it got really bad, raise it, but they're definitely not going to lower it. So that means your interest rates stay high. In turn, the government or Biden or his administration has to make it look like they're going to fight for the American people. Yep. We're going to make it more affordable for you. Guess what? We're going to just um, give you a tax break. We might you know, give some money, print some money or whatever. And it actually makes the problem worse. Bingo. Initially, it might. So like first on scene, right? Yeah, yeah, whatever. But like six months down the road, a year down the road, two years down the road, prices. I mean, we're actually in a worse situation than what we started this section of the podcast with, which is the difference between the beginning of 2020 and the beginning of 2024 was a 40% difference. Yes. And we didn't run these numbers. Obviously, it's not in the notes and we're kind of ending this podcast. Point being is if we just continue to throw money at it, and that's what we did to create this 40% rise in home prices, it's almost guaranteed, right? Set aside the data that house prices would go up just if the economy kind of stays the same. If they throw money at it, home prices will appreciate faster than they normally would. Two, there's nothing in the data to show that home prices are crashing, going to crash, or any reason to crash. Three, all of the major economic indicators, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Goldman Sachs, UBS, all revise their housing predictions of home price appreciation up in the last 30 days. Four, 
If something like this does come into effect, you ask the question, when do I buy? As an investor or as a home buyer, you want to buy before additional demand is created. If the president gets his way and gets this tax credit for first-time home buyers and what they're calling the middle-class move-up buyer, that will create additional demand. Therefore, as an investor and a home buyer, you want to purchase before the additional demand is created because no supply is being created. So if there's more demand and the same amount of supply, prices go up. And what people keep coming to is like, well, what about the economy? The economy could get quite a bit worse before home prices have to get worse. You need to go back through history and study every recession and just take the Great Recession out of it. The vast majority of recessions before that home prices were flat or up during the recession. Because of recency bias, we look at the Great Recession, we go, well, home prices have to go down. They had to go down because of oversupply. You are now undersupplied. You are a decade at a minimum away from getting oversupplied again. So just go. If you want to get in touch with me, give us a call. Our phone number is in the, in the description below. It's up above. And we look forward to chatting with you.